community. Again, pleasure to be here, uh, as always, to be able to share with you some updates from our campus on things that have taken place over the last two weeks now, and to give you updates on critical events that are also taking place at the university that we've been tracking for quite some time. So first, I'd like to start off by recognizing some of the really outstanding accomplishments that have taken place here at Neomed over the past few weeks. I think I've mentioned the names Dr. Rosen and Dr. Mellet. To that group, I would like to now add Dr. Safadi, all three from the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology, and all three of them have been awarded NIH R01 grants that are totaling uh, over the course of the life of those grants over $4 million in direct and indirect costs. Uh, but more importantly, recognizing the outstanding work of the researchers that are taking place here at Neomed. So big congratulations to all of them. I also wanna recognize the work of Elliot Reed and his team from the Ready Zone. They ran the uh, student pitch day for the Burton D. Morgan Foundation. We had an outstanding opportunity to listen to uh, students from across disciplines come together and talk about the potential of technologies that are coming out of Neomed for commercialization, understanding the intellectual property pathways, the regulatory pathways, and the business models that can be applied to those for the success of some of the great work that's being translated into the clinical space. We finished our Ohio National Guard COVID-19 testing on campus. I know mo many of you have seen some of that data, but we ended up testing uh, 2,121 um, patients who came to us to have an evaluation. Our results showed that the positivity rate was 5.5% overall, and for Portage County, it was 4.1%. So relatively low compared to the rest of the state, uh, but about where we thought it would be. Uh, one third of the patients who were tested were um, showing some type of symptoms. Uh, the other two thirds were not. I do not have the breakdown yet at this point as to which of the, um, what were the percent positive for the symptomatic versus the asymptomatic. But I do wanna thank the, the Portage County um, Department of Health as well as the Ohio National Guard for helping us to do this and recognize uh, Dale uh, Fluch and his team for the great work they did setting this up. Our intent is to continue to do this type of testing on campus as the Guard is available to assist us with that testing. They did a, a spectacular job. Uh, the return to work today marks the beginning of phase four. Um, as all of you know, we sent an email out talking about how we are approaching this, understanding that childcare uh, attendance at school is still something that is not completely available. Uh, and we do see some impact and some increases taking place. The governor has um, now ordered that all daycare facilities can go back to pre-COVID staffing and students. So we expect that to stand up. Some of the schools will not be in session until as late as after Labor Day. So we've extended the period of time for those entering into phase four who meet those needs uh, to go work with HR to be able to continue to work from home as long as their, their job uh, classification allows them to do that legally with the state of Ohio. In the meantime, I've tasked our human resources team to work with the vice presidents uh, the deans and the chairs to determine a central way of dealing with what we've learned since COVID-19 has been present uh, in the region. And that is who can do really well working from home, who cannot because of their position requirements and who can come in periodically. And what I've asked them to do is to give us a fair and equitable approach to this that looks after every member of our campus uh, to start to reduce the footprint on this campus for the long term that will help us both de-densify, that's the term that's being used by the IUC presidents and the chancellor's office to reduce the density of people on campus for COVID-19. But as that pandemic finally abates, what can we do as a university 
that's more cost effective and more efficient as an organization. And some of those decisions uh, will, will be difficult to make, but I want them to be fair and equitable. I don't want them to be different for one college or for one, under one supervisor than it is for everybody across this campus. And so they've been tasked to get that done uh, no later than that Monday following Labor Day so that we're all on the same page when, when we finally figured out the issues around childcare and around return to school for the students who are, are with uh, our employees. So that is going to be uh, announced as that uh, gets finalized and they are just working very diligently on this now. Uh, it's going to be a great deal of effort for them. Uh, our intent is for those who are coming back to campus completely or those who are here just periodically, that there will be a difference in how you see your workspace. So if we have an employee who had a private office and was here five days a week, and in the future, HR determines they can be here two to three days a week with use of touchdown space, that individual is going to lose a private office. And that private office would be either reallocated to somebody here to give them a, a more secured and socially distanced workspace who needs to be here all the time, or we would create a broader area of touchdown space that's separated and can be cleaned easily uh, to disinfect and people can come in and work in a um, good quality space for utilization during their time here on campus. So it's gonna change the way we do business. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to have a lot of people working from home with private offices that sit here unutilized. It's not a good use of resources. So stay tuned as we continue to get this worked out, but we will communicate with you to ensure that you have that information so that you understand what it is you're going to be doing. And with that, we're going to implement good online education for those who will be doing more teleworking to understand best approaches to do telework so the supervisors understand best ways to ensure accountability during that teleworking period. We looked at our current telecommuting slash teleworking policies. They're just not adequate uh, to be able to utilize broadly right now. In fact, uh, it was noted that one of the very clear exclusions is there is that you may not use teleworking simply because you don't you have childcare issues. And during COVID-19, we know that this is a real problem. And so that is something that we need to address. So please just have patience with us as we get this underway. Relate, related to return to work, I did mention in my last address two weeks ago that um, we unfortunately did have to lay off 11 employees. I was um, a little quiet about who they were because they hadn't been announced yet. And those 11 employees have now been informed and I wanted to give a little explanation of that to the group. Really, we did work out our finances at the university, providing the state doesn't change what they're expecting to give us over the, the long term, and providing we don't end up with a big second surge that results in us shutting down this campus. If things continue as we're hoping they're going to, the 11 that we did let go were because they were in conference services and we have shut down conference services on this campus. Uh, those ballrooms that were used to host events are now being used as educational space. We needed it uh, to be able to service our students who needed to be socially distant. And we expect that large gathering of individuals at places much like our ballroom are just not going to take place over the course of the ne this next year. So that was the reason for doing it. Uh, and now that all those individuals have been informed, I wanted to share that with the community. That was the reason that we had to reduce those. It's just, we didn't have the work to keep the people employed. Return to class has begun. As many of you know, our medical students are now on campus, our first years and our second years. Uh, we are following very strict guidelines for face coverings. Uh, face coverings, in fact, as you know, have been mandated at the state level across all 88 counties in Ohio when you are indoors or when you're outdoors and cannot maintain social distance of six feet. The governor has now put teeth behind that. Uh, and so there is a, a substantial penalty if the law gets involved. Uh, in fact, both uh, potential for jail time as well as large fines for individuals caught not um, following those requirements. 
my understanding is the state is not looking to really impose these with the, the police at this time, but it would remain an option if they feel that the safety and welfare of the community is being put at risk because of a large number of individuals not doing that. So following the law within the state of Ohio, we are being very adamant about utilization of face masks when you are not in a private office, uh, when you're in our buildings on campus, we're also very adamant about social distancing and utilization of hand hygiene and reporting of symptoms and symptom screening. Our students have all signed documents indicating they understand the need, uh, the intent, and their role in fulfilling these obligations. And we've had really outstanding compliance. In fact, not only outstanding compliance from them here on campus, but we've had outstanding performance from our teams who have been delivering their education in a hybrid model. And so a big thank you to the College of Medicine and everybody involved in the curriculum launched. It's gone very, very well. Dr. Mawed and uh, Dr. Young gave me a briefing on this, said it's really been outstanding. Uh, Michael Wright also gave us uh, a briefing on the hybrid education that's been taking place, indicating it's been fairly flawless to this point. So we can do this, we can keep this campus safe. And I ask all of you, including our students, to continue to abide by those rules so that we can fulfill our mission and be successful in creating the healthcare leaders of tomorrow who are being educated to do that very thing today on our campus. During our last meeting two weeks ago, I was asked the question of whether doors could be left open on private offices when individuals are working in those offices without face coverings. I did not have the answer to that. Uh, I've since um, consulted with our operations team and Dale Luch has told us that our hair, air handling systems at this university are very effective and that it wouldn't be an issue. So uh, we put that update on our website and honestly, I think it does more than just saying you can keep your door open. What it really does is says we have, we have a more open culture on our campus. People feel more welcomed instead of coming in and seeing closed doors. To be able to safely have those doors open is really critical. Uh, I do ask all of you though, as you approach a private office, as I did today, I went and met with um, Mary Taylor, our Vice President for Finance and Operations. I knocked on the door, I put my, I had my mask on and maintained my mask as I stood at her threshold and had a discussion with her. So please continue to follow every safety guideline that we have in place as we put this new implementation into process. Our strategic plan is going very well. Again, a big thank you to all of you who contributed via the surveys that went out. I've shared before that we had over 300 responses to the majority of the surveys. We have been working very closely as a team to come up with our first draft and that first draft is now um, ready and we are coming together, about 20 of us tomorrow, to spend four hours really hashing it out, understanding where we have um, some areas that need to be modified a little bit more uh, but as we tune this up, our intent is to get it out to you again, our community, part of the Neomed team to look at, to get your input from as we finalize a document for our board of trustees and their review and hopeful approval uh, on the September 9th board meeting. So thank you for everything that you've done. And I'm going to continue to ask you to do more by reviewing the document as it comes your way. I think what we're doing really captures the essence of who we are, um, who we want to be and where we're going. And it's all reflective of what you told us. This isn't 20 people coming together into a room and saying, this is what we think should happen. I intentionally created working groups um, and put people outside of their expertise in those working groups so that they weren't driving the conversation down a path that they wanted. But in fact, we were driving where we're going in the future through our strategic plan based on what you thought we needed to do. So thank you to everybody. The, um, the university will be stepping up a clinical presence on our campus very shortly. Our board of trustees had approved a, a small fee for students to be able to provide a clinician full-time on our campus 
who will be here to handle pandemic related issues, managing any need for quarantine, for isolation, uh, coordinating testing, interpreting those test results, but at the same, <clears throat> same time, also being able to provide some level of primary care. The uh, fee will not cover the total cost, so we are also putting in dollars to support that physician's presence on this campus for our faculty and for our staff. The key is this becomes another piece of our procedures and our policies to ensure we have a safe campus during COVID, and we expect this to grow over time into a clinical enterprise here on the Neomed campus that we will eventually open up into a broader clinical practice for the local community and start to have a clinical footprint like nearly every other health sciences university in the country, giving us more opportunities to control uh, the student rotations when they're available, working with our physicians. This is in its very earliest stages, and I'll update you, this over update you on this over time as it continues to grow and evolve. We have, uh, I've also received um, a large number of emails from you and, and extracted the same type of input from your survey data regarding the culture on the Neomed campus. And what I've heard from you, what I've read from you was that most of you were very content with the culture within your local work groups, that you've built strong relationships, that you're bonded, you have a strong esprit de corps with one another, but that it's somewhat lacking at times with other work groups, other, other supervisors, other departments across our campus. And we're working to really try and unify ourselves as one university and one team. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to think a little bit differently and what I'm asking you to do that, it's the way you interact with other individuals. And I know it's not the 95% of the people on this campus. It's, it's, there's a few on campus whose emails have been sent to me, whose emails have been sent outside of their work areas to others. And that may or may not have been the intent, but the tone comes across as what many describe as microaggression. Um, the inability to have a, a supportive and bilateral communication because it's somewhat cutting and aimed at the other individual as though they're not performing at the same level that you might be. And, and I'm going to ask all of you before you send an email out that you even have an inkling that there is some level of dismay in your tone that you hold off 24 hours 48 hours, review that email before you send it out. I don't care if you're a dean or a vice president sending it out to an administrative assistant in another area or one of our police officers or somebody who's working to maintain this campus. It is never acceptable for any of us to send an email out that shows that we are being disrespectful. And if I do that, then you need to come down on me. And that my intent is to never do that. We have to teach, we have to treat everybody in this university with respect, to treat each other as members of our team. And we should be doing this every day in life, but it's certainly not going to be acceptable here on this campus. So for the vast majority of you who are not doing this, I, I ask for your support. And for the few who may do it unintentionally or do it intentionally, I'm telling you it's unacceptable and it's not going to be tolerated on our campus. So please be part of the culture change, be part of the group that's unifying us and bringing us together. We have to do this. Uh, we have to treat each other with respect, regardless of what your position is. And we have to do this for our students and for our research because we will not reach our potential if we can't come together strongly as a team and be unified. So with that, I'm going to ask all of you to continue to do the great things you're doing. And let's not allow this pandemic to inhibit who we are, not allow it to have any impact on our mission. Let's be successful. Let's be Team Neomed and continue to be great as an organization 
and as a group of individuals trying to change healthcare for Ohio and to set a benchmark for this country. With that, I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. Yes, the first question, will there be any modifications to the flexible work schedule pilot program to include those who are caretakers for the elders, but not eligible for FMLA to care for them? The program seems only center on those with children to come in late or leave early. So I've asked our team, uh, led by Andre Burton in HR, to also work with legal counsel. And we have to have legal counsel in there. And the reason is to make sure we're following all the um, federal and state regulations, uh, because much of what we, have, we do is regulated by law. And in fact, there were some things we've done here in the past that later we've learned we've been really violating state law by doing unintentionally, those have been corrected. So I need them to look at this and see what it is we are allowed to do and to make recommendations that are gonna be beneficial for the university and fulfilling our operations, but at the same time, uh, take into account the needs of our employees. So the answer is we're working on it and I hope to have a, a solution out to you within the next several weeks, but certainly no later than the Monday following Labor Day was the the target deadline that I've given our team. The city COVID training we were required to view emphasizes the best way to stay safe is to stay at home and telework if possible. In light of this advice, can you please provide a rationale for why NeoMed required all of us to return to campus with no telework option available? I do understand this is in the works, but it seems this should have been in place long before now, particularly with the increase in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Waiting until September to make this decision may put us all at risk for the entire month. So we are fortunate on this campus to be um, fairly well, as I mentioned, the term that's being used by the chancellor's office is de-densified. In fact, you can walk the halls and you'll see that there's very little activity taking place. Um, relative to CSU that has a smaller overall campus size, they are roughly 85 acres relative to us being closer to 120. Um, we have 1,000 students. They have 15, 16,000 students and staff. We are already very well de-densified, and we are making the changes now that are going to be in place by September to do that at an even greater level. In the meantime, we are allowing employees who would normally have been back to work today to continue to follow the federal guidelines for safety for those individuals who are in specific conditions to be able to work from home as they have been. The city training that you performed was actually assigned before we ever had the opportunity to review it for quality. Uh, that was something that we made a decision to do because this was something advocated for by the AAMC, um, a national body who is critical to who we are. We assumed that this was going to be a good high quality work product. I took it like all of you did. And I think that many of us would say that there was um, a lot that could have been improved in that particular product to make it more useful. It was lengthy, it was redundant. Uh, it wasn't always focused on who we are as a university in what they were sharing. Uh, but the one thing that's clear is if you are at home following all safety guidelines, you're not leaving your house except to get groceries and you are essentially sheltered in place, which is where this state used to be, then telework is going to be ideal if it fits your particular job classification. As we were working our way through really eliminating everybody being on this campus with very, very few exceptions in March and delivering an online curriculum, and then slowly over time understanding where we were who could come back and then being able to teach students safely on this campus, something that's being advocated for by most um, across the higher education enterprise, we had to figure out how to return people here who are critical to supporting our students. In the meantime, we did not have a standardized procedure in place through HR that fit every position in this university to include those who are faculty and staff and classified employees. And so that is what we are doing now. 
you, you always have to worry about the unintentional consequences of your design. And what we had done initially was really focused on safety. And as we're coming back, focused on safety and marrying that with understanding how to deliver adequate resources in a de-densified campus to our students. And what I heard from many people was, I'm back, they're not back, why is that fair and equitable? And so we put in safety guidelines across this campus to ensure that what you do here and the environment that you're in was going to keep you safe and healthy from the per perspective of the pandemic. That was the policies and procedures that have been adopted across all of higher education in this state, led by Dr. Forrest Faison out at CSU, who is the former Surgeon General of the Navy and worked on by Dr. Joe Zarconi from our team, who was part of that steering group to say, here's how you can do it and here's how you keep everybody safe. And we think this is a completely safe campus to be on relative to the way you live your lives at home. And so coming back to campus is part of what we decided to do. At the same time, we're thinking about our employees who have children at home uh, who are taking care of individuals who don't have daycare because those children aren't in school because schools have not opened up yet. Daycares were not really able to take on the same level of students that they had taken on in the past. And so now we're going through this process to try and do this right. I can have five or six people say, I shouldn't be here because here's my circumstances. The response is another 20 saying, well, I'm here, why are they not here? And I get it, it comes down to being fair and equitable. And that is our goal, is to be fair and equitable and to have standardized procedures in place through the HR team. I think this is a very safe campus to be on. I'm here, uh, the leadership team is here. We're walking around with our face coverings on and observing very little activity on this campus. We are doing deep cleanings of every room's daily and multiple deep cleanings on high traffic areas daily. Our gym is opened up. The Sequoia Center is opened up following state guidelines. We just think that this is a safe place to be and we need to be able to offer a high quality education to our students and give them the adequate support services that they are also paying for to be here. Now we've safely moved people off campus to work we're bringing some back, but we're gonna do this in a fair and equitable way. And we need a little bit of time to have this in place. What are Neomed's contingency plan if or when a student, staff, or faculty member tests positive on campus? Well, we don't need any additional contingency plan. We have our policies and procedures in place now. You have to make the assumption that for but if you look at our data, 4.1% of Portage County is going to be positive. The scientific data that's been published show that if all of you follow social distancing, if all of you wear your face masks appropriately at all time, and that doesn't mean just a plastic visor over your eyes, that's actually a face covering and do appropriate hand hygiene that we are going to be safe and effective in preventing the spread from one another. So you have to make the assumption about 4.1% on this campus at any one time are going to have the virus. Our goal is to keep it from spreading. So the first point is we probably have people on campus who have it. We haven't had anybody on campus that I'm aware of who's been symptomatic from it. We've had reports of a medical student who tested positive and has been, has been in isolation off campus. We've had people who've been exposed to those who've been, known, who've been known COVID positive, who didn't know if they were or not, and they went into quarantine. So we are following state law. We are managing quarantine and isolation with the Portage County Department of Health. We have a pandemic response team on our campus uh, led by Dr. Zarconi uh, and also Jesse and Many others who have stepped in to work on this team, including our Office of General Counsel, to set those policies and procedures up. 
So we don't need anything new because it's all been laid out. It's on our website. We've sent emails out. We have a very lengthy and extensive document on how to do this. And we have an executive summary because I know not everybody wants to read the more lengthy documents. Akron Public Schools is going entirely virtual at least until November. So is Shaker Heights and Beachwood and many other school districts across the counties. Um, does Neomed have the plan for parents who have to deal with this, especially staying with children at home? So this is going to once again get back into the team that's been stood up by Andre Burton to figure out best approaches for us to do this fair and equitably. I, I would say that as their work completes, those individuals who are felt to be able to safely work at home, meaning safe, I won't say safely, effectively work at home for part of their time will be allowed to do so. At the same time, there are going to be individuals whose job requirements are going to have them on campus. And in fact, there are state laws that have us ensuring those individuals on campus, especially for classified employees. Those individuals, as we start to get beyond that September date, are going to um, have to look at the opportunity to utilize FMLA um, because we have to follow state law. There's just not anything we can do to circumvent that. Uh, and for those individuals who can perform their job duties from home and do it optimally, uh, then we're going to allow them to do so. So once again, same answer, we're going to have to wait until the team finishes their work on this so that we have a uniform, fair, and an equitable way to be able to do this. Is Neomed considering adding additional colleges or programs for other healthcare fields? Yes, we are considering it, in fact. Um, one of those that we're looking at right now is an AA program or anesthesia assistant program. Uh, if you've heard of something called a CRNA, uh, certified nurse anesthetist, they can do essentially the same thing. Uh, and they do a two year, first they follow a four year pathway, an undergraduate degree, and then complete a two year program. Ohio was one of the very first, if not the first state in the country to authorize AAs to perform anesthesia under the supervision of an anesthesiologist. There have been publications to show them to be as safe and effective as a CRNA who also works under an anesthesiologist. And this is one potential opportunity for us as there's only one other, one other university in the entire state that offers this program. Uh, we're also continuing to look at the potential for things like a dental school. Uh, but the things we do have to make sense. There has to be a need within the state for us to do it. I'm not, uh, I am not going to advocate for a program that doesn't have a demand for it, provide high quality education with the potential for a valuable job for our students. And at the same time, it's got to be a win for the university. It can't be a, it can't be a financial drain on our other programs. The mandatory city training indicates that large group meetings should be avoided. In-person classes cannot be avoided for some educational offerings, i.e. gross anatomy labs. The need for in-person classes for PI session, sessions is less clear, especially since half the class is not present in person for space reasons, and it is actually the students on Zoom, students whose faces the instructor can see during the interactions. So the decision on how to run an academic curriculum successfully has been led to each of the, each of the colleges make those decisions. Um, they felt the hybrid model was going to deliver the best quality education to the students. And that was a decision that was made by the deans and the curriculum committees that are responsible for those educational elements. My position as president is not to micromanage individuals and then tell them how to do their jobs. It's more to ensure that we are doing it to a safe level uh, that is ensuring that it's, a fa it's fair and equitable for everybody across this enterprise. Uh, but you didn't hire me to be the Dean of the College of Medicine or the Dean of the College of Pharmacy. That's what they're hired for and they have individuals who work for them. As they've gone, they're the experts. They make these decisions as they went through this process, they felt this was the safest way to do it and to follow 
all federal and state guidelines uh, regarding COVID-19, getting back to the same issues we've been talking about, which is face coverings, social distancing, symptoms reporting, and hand hygiene. So they felt like we have a very safe campus to do it. They felt this was the best way to deliver that care, and I'm supporting that decision. What is going on with the funds discussed to assist those of us in lower pay grades who had our tuition assistance removed? Many of us have our fall semester bill due Friday of this week, and it would be helpful to know where we are with this and how we should proceed. So the HR team and our advancement team met together on this. Uh, the foundation made these funds available. Uh, they are for a limited group of individuals who fall in the some of the lower pay tiers who are most affected by um, these decisions that we had to put in place for COVID-19 pandemic. And my understanding is that they had already reached out to those individuals who had applied and were qualified for it. Uh, I will ask them to please send additional um, communications out to the community to make this clear. So either you didn't receive it or you didn't acknowledge that you received it, but something should have either gone out or been communicated directly to those individuals who had applied. And I, one other clarification that I, I believe, and I, I'm gonna ask you to wait for the um, information to come back from that team, but I believe that what they were doing was reimbursing those additional dollars based on successful completion of the semester, not an upfront spend, because they just don't know if, once you've paid that tuition, they don't know if the student is going to successfully complete, complete the course of the semester. That may be something they've implemented, and I certainly would support that if they did, but I don't know, and we'll have to wait for their communication on this. Can you speak to the difference between cloth masks face shields and if face shields only fit the face covering requirement? Face shields, as I mentioned uh, during the body of this address, face shields are not adequate by themselves. You must wear a face covering, the material face covering. It does not need to be a medical grade or a surgical grade uh, face mask, but a facial covering. Uh, and it is ideal, if you wish, but not a mandate, to wear an eye covering. We know that eye transmission can occur with COVID-19. We just really don't at this point in our understanding of the disease really have a clear understanding of what percentage. It's certainly possible, but those numbers have not panned out yet through the CDC or others to be able to give us any guidance on. We cannot control the decisions of employees and students to travel internationally or at risk states. However, the required quarantine of this travel often optional travel results in negative impact to their own work and class situations. How can we deter this type of travel to minimize risk to them and others? Well, that deterrence is something that we've been um, sharing uh, verbally. Right now, the state of Ohio is asking people to quarantine from specific areas. We have said at the university that we've eliminated travel professionally. Uh, certainly international travel has been eliminated professionally. I don't believe it's very easy to get an international trip right now. Uh, and, and, and that's being handled by the CDC as far as mandating any types of quarantines by law on individuals who've been in those countries. The state of Ohio, as I understand it, most recently has made this a voluntary process. Uh, if you look at some of our adjacent states like Pennsylvania, uh, New York, uh, fairly close to us, they all have mandatory quarantines for up to 14 other states in this country. If you've traveled to them, they expect you to quarantine for 14 days, but they're not, they're not actively going out and ensuring people are legally following those rules. There are more recommendations. And so we can follow state law. We really have no authority beyond that. And we don't have the resources to track where every individual of our community has gone and then to hold them accountable for it. Instead, what we tell them is if you've traveled to these areas, the expectations are that you report it to us something Dr. Zarconi's team is collecting the information on 
and that you go into a self-imposed quarantine. Is there any update on which health care provider will be working out of the new medical office building? So we have uh, not formally signed the contract with the individual yet. So if you'll give me a, hopefully within two weeks, we'll have the answer for you on that. And we're going to have several providers who will be there in a part-time capacity to fulfill at least one, if not uh, one and a half to two full-time equivalents. Um, we have the individuals identified who will be starting, but I can't share the names because they haven't actually signed the contracts formally yet. Uh, and I don't wanna give you misinformation. Some students do not use the Sequoia gym at all. Is it going to be required to be incorporated within their tuition this fall as well? It's actually one of the health fees. So the health fees covers a number of different things that are supplied to our students on this campus. One component of it is the ability to be able to utilize the Sequoia Center. Other components include the mental health counselors that we have here on campus, as well as the team that's working to support the COVID-19 uh, safety precautions that are being put into place. So yes, it is, it is a requirement uh, based on the fees of this university. There are no more questions. Great, well, thank you all for your time and I look forward to meeting with you again in two weeks. Stay safe.